in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Over two-thirds of the globe on which we live is water. The oceans, the sea. From the beginning of time, that sea around us has been a source of mystery. An enormous watery world of fear of the unknown. To some, like the great American poet Walt Whitman, it was also a place of miracles. To me, he said, the sea is a continuous miracle. The fishes that swim, the rocks, the motion of the waves, the ships with men in them. What stranger miracles are there? Our mystery drama, City of the Dead, was adapted from the H.G. Wells short story, In the Abyss, especially for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Christopher Tabori and Earl Hammond. is 1896, more than 80 years ago. In a marine biological laboratory in New England, a little group of scientists and technicians are gathered before Dr. Stanley Weybridge, director of the institute and chief of a newly developing science called oceanographic studies. He stands, pointer in hand, before an enlarged wall map of the Caribbean Sea as he concludes a briefing on the most adventurous, the most perilous project ever undertaken by the Institute. I cannot say, gentlemen, that the plan is without danger. I wish I could. Indeed, there is every risk imaginable. But I assure you that no precaution, even the most minute, will be overlooked. Every safety device we know of will be used. Are there any questions? Yes, Sam? Uh, Dr. Weybridge... Will you tell us a little more about the place we're going to, the Cambridge Trough? Well, it starts about here on the map, deep off the coast of Haiti. Mm -hmm. Now, here you see how it follows a southwesterly course for almost a thousand miles to the Pacific coast of Guatemala. Yes, sir? That big crack on the map there. Well, that huge crack in the surface of the earth was produced by movements within the earth. Movements which have never really stopped, which accounts for the frequent earthquakes in that part of the world. So far as we know, the trough is the deepest point of the sea on the entire face of the globe. Do we know how deep the trough is? Well, we've taken soundings. In some places, over 22,000 feet. That's more than four miles. And uh, in six months from now, that's where Star and I will be making the dive. Correct. The mother ship, the Captain Nemo, will be stationed right about here. Mm -hmm. Not far off the coast of Grand Cayman Island itself. Uh, and the Poseidon, our little uh, home away from home, the steel globe that will be our transportation to the bottom of nowhere. Will be detached and dropped from the stern of the Nemo from this scaffolding here on the drawing. It's constructed of three-inch steel, eight feet in diameter. <laughs> With all the comforts of home, right? Special air cushions padding the inside, two portholes near the bottom of the craft. <laughs> so we can play peekaboo with the barracudas. <laughs> the windows of the portholes are made of a special variety of glass, three inches thick, to withstand the pressures you will meet at that depth. Uh, Dr. Weybridge, we have volunteered for what I'm sure will turn out to be a huge barrel of fun. Uh, a little dangerous, maybe, but fun. Sam, be serious for a moment. I give you my word that everything will be minutely inspected. The ballast device for submerging and getting back up again, the pressure mechanisms, the depth indicator, the oxygen supply, the Myers apparatus for purging the carbon dioxide you'll be exhaling. Uh, we've thought of everything. Everything except that we won't be able to communicate with you on the surface in case of trouble. Well, that is true. It's the one thing we'd like to do, but we can't. I understand. Once we start down, we'll be free-floating entirely on our own. For the next six months, you two will go through the most intensive training possible in handling the sphere. <laughs> I wish I were young enough to see for myself firsthand the things you're going to see. 
Have you any idea? Like what? No, not exactly. But there have to be things down there that no living man has ever experienced. Things that go beyond the wildest dreams of our imagination. Sam, Star, the day has come when man, through you, is about to probe some of the darkest mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Weybridge, for permitting my wife to come aboard. Oh, Doris is one of the best research assistants the Institute's ever had. She's more than welcome. Thank you, Dr. Weybridge. I envy Sam and Star. I wish I were going with them. Mm, you picked a perfect day for this Caribbean holiday, didn't you, Doctor? <laughs> yes, clear sky, blazing sun, and a gentle swell. Water temperatures nearly 80. An ideal day for swinging those 20 tons of iron out into the briny. Uh, to say nothing of the two utterly defenseless young men inside that iron. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Doctor, last night Doris and I were making some quick calculations. Now, at the surface, the pressure is of 14 pounds per square inch. Eh? Right. 30 feet down, it's double that, right? Mm. And at a mile, that's 5,280 feet. The pressure uh, becomes something like a ton and a half per square inch. And at five miles. Yes, I know, I know. But you've got the steel walls of the globe to protect you. And the globe is pressurized. Now, we put that sphere through every test we could think of. The margin for error has been reduced to the absolute minimum. Mm. Well, it's 11.56, boys. Four minutes till noon, and the descent of the Poseidon. Prepare to climb the scaffolding for boarding. Yes, sir. Ready, sir. Uh, one final review of the procedure. Now, the two of you will let yourselves into the open porthole. It will then be screwed into place from the outside. The sphere will be hoisted over the side, the lines cut, and the sphere dropped into the sea. You understand? Oh, yes, we understand, sir. And once in the water, only we have control of the ballast. Right. You will regulate ballast so as to let yourselves down gently. Thirty-five minutes for the descent, and then an hour for observation, and two hours for coming up. Total, a little over three and a half hours. Your oxygen supply is good for five hours. For each of you. Uh, well, we'll watch it like hawks. And the pressure indicators. Uh, we'll be lying off a couple of miles to the southeast. Uh, so you don't collide with us as you surface. Any questions? Uh, yeah, one last request, sir. If this time, I'd like to kiss my wife. <laughs> I love you, Sam. Oh, well, don't worry, dear. I think everything's going to be fine. Just 100% fine. Oh, and remember, we've got a big date for a turtle steak when I get back up. At exactly 12 noon, they swung us overboard. My heart nearly burst with excitement as they led us down foot by foot to the surface of the water. And then, they cut the line that attached us to the tackle above us. For a moment, we seemed to be stationary. And then, with a gigantic splash, the sea closed over us. And we started our journey. Well, this is it, Star. What are you thinking? How my mother always hoped I'd grow up to be a brilliant criminal lawyer instead of a marine biologist. <laughs> That's very funny. So did my mother. <laughs> Only she wanted me to be a doctor. Look above you, Star. I'm trying to, but that huge burst of air bubble shooting upward is blocking the view. Well, they're just about gone by now. How quickly the color of the sea changes. From light greenish blue, darker and darker, to that rich blue of stained glass windows. Yes. Well, now it's almost midnight blue. Yeah. Uh, how far down are we? A little over 600 feet. Uh, good. Mark that in your log. Absolutely pitch black already. It's like velvet. Now, I better turn on the electric spot. No, no, not just yet. Take a look at those. Why, it's like a whole world of tiny blinking lights. What do you suppose they are? Not the faintest idea. They're flashing by so fast, like streaks of green lightning. Some of them strung together like a train racing by on a very dark night. Now, all right, turn on the floodlights. Oh, no. They all disappeared with the light. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Will you take a look at that? The famous reverse snowfall Weybridge and the divers told us about, as if millions and millions of little snowflakes were falling up as we go plunging down. Some of them living creatures, and the others the remains of those that have died, right? Head of the class, Mr. Norton. 
Just keep your fingers crossed that we don't wind up as part of a reverse snowfall. We kept on falling. Falling. Down, 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 faster and faster. It was like being in an elevator in one of those new skyscrapers and the cable that holds it in place suddenly breaks and you keep going down, waiting for the inevitable crash that will destroy it and you. Uh, are you all right, Star? You look a little uncomfortable. Uh, it's got a little warm. Yeah, well, I, I guess we underestimated the effect of the friction of the globe against the water. Uh, we'd better take off some of these heavy clothes. Uh, careful. Don't touch the glass of the porthole. You, you might burn yourself. Where are we? Over 10,000 feet, nearly two miles. Hmm. Hey, see how the sides of the trough, uh, the trench walls, keep going straight up and down like the sides of an underseas mountain. Well, which is what it really is. The water temperature outside must be close to zero at this depth. Yes, I would think so. Let's hope Weybridge was right. That the windows of the portals will hold up against the pressure and the... and against the contrast in temperatures inside and outside the sphere. We're past 21,000 feet. And still dropping. Oh, there's got to be an end. You all right? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, great. You? Uh, I'm pretty warm. I ain't gonna take my shirt off. Me, me too. I, I'm, I'm bathed in perspiration. Any change in the scenery? Uh, just more slabs of rock. Uh, once in a while, a huge, gigantic sponge growing out of the rock. Then there's some coral. Uh -huh. A few jellyfish. No, 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 not, not much else. Come on. Well, I, I think we've come to the last stop, Star. Whew, what's your reading? It's uh, almost 20, 26,000 feet. Wow, can you believe it? Five miles. I, I turn the lights on all over the place. Star, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Not many fish. Well, at this depth, what do you expect? Well, there are a few, and... They're so brightly colored. Yes, in spite of the darkness. They must be some kind of built-in headlights that, that we can't see that lets them see one another. I'd say all of them are blind. You know, maybe. Hey, ho hold it, Star. Hold it. Look at that big one coming right at us. The size of him. And how slow he moves. Oh, he must be the grandfather of everything down here. Uh, he's pushing his nose right against the glass. How can he live under this pressure? Oh, I, I, I don't know, but the fact is he's very much alive. And that is what I find so hard to believe. Well, what are you talking about? Now, look, Star, either I'm dreaming and this is all some kind of crazy nightmare, or... Or what? Take a very good look at old Grandpa out there. What about him? Star... That species of fish has been dead, extinct, for over 100 million years. Scientists tell us that every form of living thing had its beginnings in the sea. That the morning of the world was started in the depths of the oceans, in the dark, backward, and abysm of time, as Shakespeare put it. Sam Elstead and Star Norton have been startled by the sight of a living prehistoric fish, a species that died out long before there ever was a man on Earth. What other wonders will their strange journey to the bottom of the sea lead them to? I shall return shortly with Act Two. In 1996, the time of our story, the airplane, the automobile, radio, all were but a gleam in the brain of geniuses, nothing more. These discoveries were yet to come. The two young biologists of our tale have already accomplished a miracle never before attempted by man. In their specially constructed iron globe, equipped with every scientific device known at the time, they have probed five miles below sea level to the bottommost part of the oceans. In the interest of enlarging man's knowledge of the world about him, as well as the world beneath him, they have made their first amazing discovery. Take a look at that fish star. 
Do you remember ever having seen anything like it before? Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's something very familiar about it. Back at college, when we were reading about things like uh, dinosaurs and brontosaurs and all those kind of fantastic animals that lived millions of years ago. Uh, yes, uh, what, what about them? Yeah, well, those were the land animals. Do you remember what was in the sea? Uh, let me see now. Uh, there, there was this one fish that was the ancestor of all the amphibians, mm -hmm. and as time went on, of other vertebrates on land. What was the name of it? Does the name coelacanth ring any kind of a bell? Of course, coelacanth. With the overdeveloped fins that grew strong enough to get it out of the water and onto the land. Exactly. Now take another look at old Grandpa out there. A coelacanth. That's what it is. But, but no, but there isn't any such thing. Not anymore. They've become extinct. They died out with the dinosaurs. That's exactly the point. Those prehistoric monsters died out over a hundred million years ago. Only nobody ever told that to our friend out there. Uh, what, what, what's that? A storm? Down here? Are you out of your mind? Well, then what is it? The noise seems to have stopped. Hmm. Did, did you feel anything, Sam? Well, it must have been some sort of a, a minor tremor. Did you see how old Grandpa skittered away into a cave when the noise began? Star, are you finding it hard to breathe? Uh, not, not, not really. Well, huh. well, maybe. I, yeah, a little. I, I, I have this slight headache. I'll make a note of it. Okay, well, now, why, why don't you take it easy for a couple of minutes? I'll take over while you rest. I sat looking through the window of the porthole, fascinated by what I saw. There were hundreds of small, large-eyed things, all of them certainly blind, crawling sluggishly like little lobsters across the track of our lights, leaving furrowed trails behind them. I made notes of everything. Suddenly, I saw the outlines of, of, of something working its way slowly, threateningly toward the Poseidon. It was upright and seemed as tall as a man. What, what do you suppose that is out there? I don't know. I can only see the dim outlines. But it's coming closer. It's not swimming. It's, I, it, it seems to be walking. Yeah, here, fo focus your light onto its head. Okay, yeah, there we are. Hmm. Shut its eyes to close out the light. What is it? An animal of some kind. I, I think I, it's not a fish. Certainly no kind of fish we've ever seen. It seems to be standing upright on two strong legs, balancing itself on a long, thick tail. Look, look, look at its dark purple head, like a lizard or an iguana. And, and two large protruding eyes bulging out of their suck. Sockets, like a grog or a toad. Look, star, where the ears should be. There are two large gill covers. I see. And threads uh, or filaments floating out of them like the branches of a tree. What can they be? Oh, I have no idea. Here, move the light a bit. As long as we keep the light on it, it stands still. But when we move the light, it, it, it moves. Its skin is so loose. It's almost as if it were wearing clothes. Look at its... It's paws or fins. Yeah, whatever they are. They're shaped like hands. Like the hands of a man. But he's, he's holding something in, in one of them. A long shaft of bone tipped with copper. Like a hammer of some kind. A sledgehammer. That face. It's almost human. It's grotesque. Uh, distorted, maybe. But those are the features of a living man. Sam... Look what it's doing now. It's blinking its eyes open. It's shading them with its free hand against our light. Oh, now it's opening its mouth. As if it were as if it were trying to say something. I'll turn on the listening device. Why, why is he bellowing that way? What does it mean? What do you suppose he wants? I, I don't know, Star. But I think we're about to find out. who we are. He's coming closer. Do 
we answer? No, 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 no. Stay perfectly still. Don't move. Stay back. Come. 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 Come and see. Look. Look at him now. Moving sideways to get out of the glare of our light. He's disappeared. I, I can't see him. Uh, no, neither can I. He may have moved around to the back of us. Uh, he's around somewhere, hiding. What's that? The whole globe is swaying. Star, look. Look at the glass. Peering right into the porthole. Their noses pressed against the glass. Their popping eyes staring in at us. Now, there are two of them. Another cup of coffee, Mrs. Elstead? Thank you, Dr. Weybridge. We'll make this the last one. <laughs> what time is it now? You just asked. Did I? Uh, it's almost two o'clock. The boys have surely started up on their way back now. Oh, I hope so. If they could only get through to us some way. Well, all they have to do is put the clockwork mechanism in action and up they go. And that's foolproof? <laughs> Nothing is absolutely foolproof, my dear. But there's nothing to be concerned about. It's all so simple. The mechanism outside the globe releases a spring knife. The knife cuts the cord that holds the ballast? Exactly. And then they just get rid of enough ballast for them to float upward to the surface. Matter of a couple of hours, more or less. Another hour and a half, then? Well, by 3.30, you should have your husband right back here on the deck of the Nemo. Oh. earth are those monkeys trying to do? Banging on the outside of the sphere with those sledgehammers. Every once in a while, they stop and, and, and peer in through the portholes. Get away from there! Stop that banging! They're looking in on us to see what effect their hammering is having on us. Star, what's our depth? It's still 26,000. Pressure? Satisfactory. Oxygen? Enough to stay submerged for at least another hour. If we have to, before surfacing. And the mechanism for the release of the ballast? Ready. Anytime you say, Sam. All right. I took a particular care of that one myself before we came down here. To get anywhere near the, the ballast release or the glass of the porthole windows, we're in real trouble. I'm going to turn on the listening device. Hear what they're saying. I'm finding it a little hard to breathe. I don't find breathing any easier than you do. Then what is it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. All right, turn on the place. What do you hear? What, what, what are they... Quiet. What? Let me listen. Come all of you. See what is here. Come help us destroy. Turn it off. You hear what he said? I heard. They declared war on us, Star. And we haven't a single weapon to fight back with, except one. Now, it's the only thing we can do. We've got to cut our ballast lines and get out of here as fast as our ship will take us. Yes, there's no choice. What? 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 Hey, what what's happening? Place? What's happening? I... Hey, Star. Yeah? Star, I think we're moving. Oh, we certainly are. Yeah, but not up. As much as sidewise. Well, how, how could that be? I don't know, but the spear is beginning to spin. I, I think we're being drawn through the water. Do you see anything? No, nothing. Nothing. There's nobody out there. We've got to get out of here just as fast as we can. Those monsters out there have probably attached a line of some kind of the sphere. Well, if they have, once we cut the ballast lines and start shooting up to the surface, we'll rip that line right out of their ugly little hands. Nothing will hold us back. Why do you suppose they're towing us away? I wouldn't know. You look at them. Can you see them, Star? There must be at least 500 of them. Yeah, jumping around like a pack of crazy kangaroos. And they are pulling us. Well, let them. And let us keep our minds on getting up to the Nemo. Weybridge calculated about uh, two hours for the ascent. C could we drop more ballast than we planned and get up any sooner? No, 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 I, I, I wouldn't dare. If the slightest thing went wrong, we'd both get to the surface all right, but as a couple of corpses. Hey, how are you feeling? It's not too well, Sam. That headache has tightened around my head like an iron band. 
Oh, no. No, not another earthquake. Here, take this handkerchief, Star. You've got a bit of a nosebleed. I... I don't feel too well at all, Sam. I... I, I think I'm going to pass out. Well, not before we put the clockwork into action. Get rid of some of this ballast. Steady, Star, steady. While I regulate the pressure gauge and, and the oxygen control, you... you cut half the ballast. Now... Now, Star, now, what are you waiting for? It's stuck, Sam. It's not working. The mechanism's gone dead. Are you out of your mind? It's got to work. Then you make it. See for yourself. Nothing's happening. Maybe a piece of seaweed or or something has temporarily jammed it. Sam. What? Friends out there. Yeah? Is it possible they knew our lives depended on that ballast mechanism and and the... that they have destroyed it by knocking it out with their, with their sledgehammers. Hey, you, you may be right. But we've got to keep trying, Star. We have got to. Between those crazy devils out there and what may be an earthquake, we're in trouble. Very serious trouble. strange world of heavy blackness, a swarm of luminous, man-sized creatures, looking almost human, have appeared outside the Iron Globe, Poseidon. They have lifted it off the bottom of the sea. The attempts of young Elstead and Norton to break away, to rise to the surface and the safety of the mothership, seem to be thwarted by these weird sea animals, who are dragging them off to... To where? To Act 3, of course. I shall return shortly. The sea, we have been told, is the right-hand man of time. Every secret since the beginning of time lies hidden somewhere in the water's depths. The time in this instance is 1896. Outside the underwater globe, Poseidon, a funnel of pale light pierces the darkness for a few yards, disclosing the peaceful, undulating expanses of graying white ooze, broken here and there by the tangled thickets of a growth of sea lilies waving their hungry tentacles. Inside the metal globe, Two men scramble desperately to free themselves from what seems to be the inevitable. To escape from the perils of the unknown to the safety of the known. Star, you've got to cut the line to that ballast. Every extra minute we stay down here is another minute off our lives. I'm doing the best I can, Sam. The cutting mechanism, it, it, it just isn't working. I'm almost sure those devils smashed the clockwork mechanism. We have got to go on hoping that they didn't. That that it's only being blocked by something. I hope you're right. Well, I'm turning the oxygen supply down a bit. And the apparatus for purging what we breathe out, up. No, no, not too much, Sam. I'm having trouble enough breathing as it is, and and so are you. Well, I'm going to crouch down low, close to the lower porthole. I'm going to throw my way to that side. Maybe I can get a look at what's happening below us. That's a good idea. Do you see anything? No, it's just some huge, huge cracks in the sea bottom. I can just barely make them out. Anything else? No, our, our friends have some kind of cable on us. They're still very much with us. Oh, I'd give anything to know. Where they're taking us? Yes. Well, wherever it is, Star. But let's hope it's soon. Because the way things are going... You don't have to say it. Uh Sooner or later, that oxygen gauge is going to read a perfectly round zero. Which we will never see. Then it won't matter where those monkeys have taken us, will it? Oh, any luck in the ballast lines? No, nothing. (laughs) You know, I've heard of dead men being buried at sea. This may be the first time it's going to happen to two men who are still alive. (laughs) What time is it, Star? Nearly four o'clock. Well, I hope my wife won't be too disappointed. 
if she doesn't have turtle steak for dinner tonight. Isn't there anything we can do, Dr. Weybridge? You know, for the past hour, we've been sweeping slowly in a spiral around the spot where the Poseidon submerged. With no sign of it. I don't think I can stand it any longer, Dr. Weybridge. Now, you've got to get hold of yourself, Doris. What possibly could have happened? I couldn't say. Maybe the windows burst in on them and mashed them to pieces. Oh, I doubt that very much. Maybe the clockwork's gone wrong? Well, that's not very likely either. But if it has, Sam and Star are down there five miles under our feet. In the cold and the dark, anchored in that little bubble of yours. Counting off the minutes of life that are still left now, to them. Now, Doris, stop that. Stop it and listen to me. If anything serious has gone wrong, and I'm sure it hasn't, remember, they have enough oxygen for another good hour, at least. It's too soon to start worrying. You've got to be patient. Oh, if there were only something we could do. <laughs> now, stop that, Doris. Stop it. I can't help it. It's so funny. What pitiful, arrogant little creatures we humans are. Down there, miles and miles of water reaching to Lord knows where. And this beautiful blue sky stretching out over us with no end. And we, proud, insignificant little pygmies, feel we have to conquer it all. Why do we have to stick our big noses into every unknown secret of the universe? Why can't we let things alone? Dad, do you see anything? Oh, you stop moving. The spinning stopped. So is the rocking. Something funny is happening out there. It seems to have got lighter. As if there were a, a broad horizon and a pale, luminous sky. And our friends? They've got us suspended like a balloon, some hundred or so feet above the bottom. There seem to be thousands of them. No. What is it? Star. There's a whole city down there. Streets and houses and waving trees spread all over the place. And there's a building much taller than the rest. It looks like a ruined abbey or a cathedral of some kind. Take a look for yourself. You're absolutely right. It's, it's all laid out like a big map. But none of the houses have a roof. Look, you can see inside every one of them. Everything's so, so white. Sam, where are we? Where have they taken us? They've got us inside the walls now. They're, they're made of waterlogged wood and twisted copper wire rope and iron spars and... Yeah, and what? The dead white bones and skulls of human beings. All over the place. In zigzag lines and spirals and curves. Let me take a look. Thousands of silvery little fish darting in and out of the eye sockets. Look at those devils now. What are they up to? Uh, lying down flat on their bellies, prostrating themselves in front of our globe. All except that very tall one standing in front of them. Yes. On top of a platform encrusted with more skulls and bones. Oh, it's, it's, it's a woman. Her scales, or whatever they are. Look like a shining robe of some kind. And she's got a crown on her head. She just stands there above the rest of them, opening and shutting that snake mouth of hers as if she were leading the others in some kind of prayer. I'm turning on the listening device. Oh, beloved people of perpetual night, lend ear to what I say. It has been told that there exists another world above us. A strange heaven of light called the sun, the moon, the stars. It seems she's the high priestess of this place. Shh, the ancient scrolls tell of fantastic creatures who inhabit this unknown world. Creatures who breathe air, who 
know of a thing called fire, whose blood is warm. We know them from the bones and from the skulls we have collected. Do you suppose? Shut up. Two of these shining creatures have rained down upon us like a blessed meteor out of the mysterious blackness of our watery sky. We must show them our reverence and our love. These are the gods that were described in our ancient writings. These are the gods to whom we must do honor. She's talking about us, Sam. I know. We must now release them from the star that brought them to us so we may worship them with fullness of heart. You may proceed. What? Well, what are they going to do? You hear? They're going to release us from our star. They're going to open this thing and let us out. No, but that's a certain death sentence. That's, that's the choice. Suffocation from lack of oxygen or drowning. They, they're back at the windows. If they manage to crack one of them... No, no, it's not likely. The glass is three inches thick. I can feel it. The line may attach to us. So it's loose. It's, it's been torn out of bands. Well, it's been cut by the rocks. We're going up, Star. I can't believe it. We're rising up. Up. We could feel the impact of the globe shooting up to the surface, slowed only by some of the lead ballast that was still attached to it. Star had already passed out. Then, something like a huge wheel was suddenly released in my head, spinning around and around. I fought with every ounce of strength left in my body to hold on, but in seconds, I too collapsed and lost consciousness completely. The next thing I saw was the face of my wife looking anxiously into mine. Are you all right, darling? Uh, I, I, I suppose so. Where's Star? Still with the ship's doctor. The doctor says he'll be all right. Well, you had us so worried there for a while, Sam. But we're glad you're back. You have no idea how glad I am to be back, Dr. Weybridge. What happened? Let's say... Let's say we had a couple of anxious moments. The main thing is you're here. Whatever it was, you're very lucky. The doctor says that you'll both be back to your normal selves in a couple of days. I... Where did we surface, Doctor? I, I blacked out before I could tell. Well, the Poseidon shot up out of the water not more than a quarter of a mile from where we were waiting. We unscrewed the hatch and found the two of you lying crumpled up on the bottom. They couldn't tell whether you were dead or alive. What really made us swallow hard was the fact that you had only six minutes of oxygen left. Six minutes. That's all. Uh, what's that you're holding in your hand, Doctor? Uh, well, I thought after you were arrested, you might be able to tell me. Well, what is it? Well, uh, in going over the outside of the sphere, one of the boys found these two little things jammed into the clockwork mechanism. May I see them, please? Uh, uh, handle them carefully, Doris. They're a specimen of sea animal I've never seen in my entire professional experience. Mm. About five inches long. Mm. Heads like a lizard of some kind. Strong legs, wide, flat tail. But look at the pectoral fins, if you can call them that. They're like little human hands. Their faces, in some peculiar way, look pretty human, too. Did you come across any of them down there, Sam? Well, we, we saw something like them, but what we saw was longer than five inches. I remind you that seen through the three-inch thick glass of your portholes, they would have been magnified. Magnified? Of course. Of course. Yes, at least 12 or 15 times. From where you sat, one of these fellows, if you had seen them, would have appeared to have been almost as big as a man. As big as a man? What, what do you think it is, Doctor? Well, I can't be sure. But what you brought up may well be a kind of prehistoric cross between some kind of fish 
a hangover from a long-forgotten past, and what millions of years later was to evolve into a man. If I told you we'd seen thousands of them, that they attacked us, and that their top lady tried to make gods of us, would you say that we had gone out of our minds? No, not out of your minds, but definitely out of this world. Some scientists have stated, without equivocation, that they see no reason why, under certain conditions, intelligent, water-breathing vertebrates could not live at the bottom of the deepest sea. Of course, you're entirely free to disagree with the scientists and say that Elsted and Norton, suffering from a lack of oxygen, may have dreamed the whole thing up. The choice is entirely yours. I shall be back shortly. In February 1976, three men in a craft called the Alvin actually made a journey two miles deep into the waters of the Caribbean off Grand Cayman Island. Their findings were little short of astonishing. What is most remarkable is that so many of the things they saw were identical to what H.G. Wells created out of his imagination over 80 years ago in the story you have just heard. Our cast included Christopher Tabori, Earl Hammond, Court Benson, and Catherine Byers. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Mr. Carter restates and toughens his stance on Yugoslavia. I'm Jerry Landy reporting on the CBS radio network. In his first news conference since the election victory, President-elect Jimmy Carter drew back from a controversial campaign declaration that he would never send American troops to the defense of independent Yugoslavia in event of a Russian invasion. If the Soviet Union should uh, invade Yugoslavia, that this would be an extremely serious breach of peace. It would be a threat to the entire world uh, as far as a peaceful world is concerned. It would make it almost impossible for us to continue under the broad generic uh, sense of detente. And whether or not we actually committed troops to Yugoslavia uh, would be uh, conjectural. My opinion is that, that that would be unlikely, but I would have to make a, a decision on the final basis at that point. In Plains, Georgia, Mr. Carter said a tax cut for those on the lower end of the income scale is a strong possibility if the economy stays soft when he takes office. But he made it clear it's still too early to talk about his cabinet appointments or his priorities. Whether we'll move uh, first, though, on, on health care or welfare reform or government reorganization or energy policy or tax reform, uh, those uh, sequence of, of major proposals will have to be evolved uh, in the weeks to come. I do not know the sequence yet. Reporters pressed Mr. Carter on whether the narrowness of the election denied him a mandate to enact his program. Carter declared that a number of presidents have both reigned and governed, though elected with less than a majority of the popular vote, and said he'll press his program aggressively. But Congressman John Anderson of Illinois, chairman of the House Republican Conference, offered a caution. I think he would be well advised 
uh, to take a, a very modest view of, uh, of the extent of his mandate. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, when you win, when you win as narrowly as he did, uh, there's some question in my mind as to whether there's any mandate at all. Anderson adding the business climate had greater need of confidence than a tax cut to restore momentum to the economy. Britain's Labour government has lost its overall majority in the House of Commons, but officials insisted Labour can continue to govern with the support of four non-Labour members and that Prime Minister Callaghan will not call for an early general election. Labour, beset by inflation and a falling pound, sustained the parliamentary losses in special elections for vacant seats in the House of Commons. Opposition Conservatives picked up two seats in what are considered Labourite strongholds. Japan's Deputy Prime Minister Takeo Fukuda has resigned from the cabinet. Fukuda is the principal rival to Prime Minister Takeo Miki and has been trying to oust Miki for his handling of the Lockheed bribe scandal. But Miki has steadfastly refused to quit. There's to be a general election in Japan in a month's time. The official newspaper of Egypt, Al-Ahram, has called on other Arab states to consider mending their fences with the Soviet Union. The newspaper also suggested resort to possible new ways of using the oil weapon. This, says the paper, as a result of the pro-Israeli policies of President-elect Jimmy Carter. Adjusted and corrected vote totals in Ohio show that Jimmy Carter's margin of victory over President Ford has slipped below 5,000 votes the narrowest presidential margin there in nearly a century. I'm Jerry Landay, CBS News. Vice President-elect Mondale now has had his first taste of what it's like to be vice president. He was featured along with President-elect Carter Thursday night in what was billed in advance as a Plains, Georgia joint news conference. The session lasted 30 minutes. No one asked Mondale a single question. I'm Mike Stanley, CBS News.